Hello everybody and welcome to another Bedroom Guru. It's another crap day for me, me wise. I'm puffy and feel rubbish. So I thought I'd do another video. Bad day for me is a good day for you because you can listen to me go on again. I wanted to address today something that everybody asks in the whole of the universe. Is there an afterlife? Does heaven exist? To me, absolutely 100% yes. Um, I've visited many, many times um, and seen what goes on up there. Um, I think the easiest way is for me to describe a man map, if you like, a map um, that everybody can understand. It doesn't, it's not really like that up there, but if, it's really hard to, um, you know, describe frequencies and dimensions and layers. So I've kind of been shown um, from my luck there, whether it's the guides or the angel realms, um, are kind of like places where everything is, just to help explain it a bit better. Um, I suppose I should start at the beginning, really, because you're all thinking, yeah, right, it's been to heaven, whatever. Um, the incredible thing is, what I will say is, is that um, everything that I've seen and experienced has been seen and experienced by the people. I watch a lot of near-death experience videos um, and I've read a lot of books about people that have, you know, been to heaven or have managed to meditate and get up there. And the similarities and descriptions are startling um, to what I've actually experienced, um, which is good for me because it obviously backs it up. Because, you know, you've got to remember with mediums, our biggest doubt is, are we making it up? You know, is it all in our minds? Is it all a load of old rubbish? Are we just like creating this wonderful picture? But as I go on, I'll explain to you and then I'll leave it to you to see what you think. It first started, it must have been about 20 years ago now, when I first started sitting in circles. Um, there was a lady who ran the circle that used to take us to a place called the Crystal Palace. I'd never heard of it in my life. Um, and no matter how many times I tried to go to this place, I ended up just seeing spirit people and bringing messages back for the rest of the circle. I just couldn't get there and I just wandered off in my own little world, you know. And, and it was really getting on my nerves a bit. But then when I started running my own circles and my first um, development centre, Enigma Sanctuary, I thought, hang on a minute, I'm starting to go through the doors here. Um, so I'm going to describe to you what they've shown me. As I said, it's a very man-made view that they've created so that I can explain it better to you. Um, otherwise, it would be totally inexplicable. I couldn't, you know... I, I just couldn't describe it any other way unless they kind of said, well, this is this room, that's that room. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. When I first went up there, I was in a really pure white mist and I saw that I was nothing but a ball of light. I was just this light being that was just resonating light and there was a humming sound. And then there was this most, again, I can't describe it to you, this, the... The melody that was playing um, was just incredible. It was just like a thousand caring, loving, beautiful voices all at once, which I've subsequently learned are the voices of the seraphim, which I'll talk about a bit later. Um, I walked along this like crystalline path, and again, there was just mist everywhere, and all these like, you know, um, spheres of light were coming at me. And I said, I remember, I'll never forget it. I remember asking, what are they? And they said, people's souls. So they were just these beings of light. And it was a bit like, if any of them came close to me, it was a bit like looking at a Facebook page. You got this instantaneous um, information downloaded of that soul. You know, who they were, what their name was, what they looked like. And it was really weird. It was like... Um, I don't know. It's see. This is. I knew it was going to be hard to explain this. It's like you you're just walking into a soul's um, data, and know their history, their background, who they are, who they were on the earth plane. It's just amazing. Um. So I had that, and then eventually I got to these three steps. These three steps are basically, um, I suppose, steps not of judgment, but steps of um reading your energy your soul because remember most people that experience heaven have passed or have had near-death experience i was meditating and it was without going into another you know digressing into another big story um i managed to get into sign the acacia records which i'll talk about another time 
And then they said, you know, you, you've got a higher energy. You're one of the higher beings on the planet, fifth dimensional higher being that can get here. And we will allow you to visit so you can share with others. It's like, that ain't bad. I'd prefer a Robbie Williams backstage ticket, but no, I'm only joking. So anyway, um, I thought, great. So I think the three three steps kind of read your energy to see if you can handle the vibration of it. Um, and it's funny, isn't it? You remember that old song, There's Three Steps to Heaven? Anyway, anyway, I'm just mad. So basically, these steps, I think, they kind of like read you to see if you're ready to take on the vibration, the frequency of when you go in there. That's what I think it was, because that's what it felt like. I felt like I was being scanned, to be honest with you. These huge doors then stood in front of me, and I mean colossal, huge, huge wooden doors. Um, and when I looked around me, I can only describe it. The best way of describing it, I suppose, is the um, Walt Disney Castle. It was just huge with turrets, um, and it was all like selenite, like pure white glinting crystal. It was so beautiful. I didn't even want to go in because that, you know, on, on its own was enough. And again, I can't put any human word to describe the colour, the dimensions, the light. It's, it's inexplicable. It's like nothing on this planet. It's just not even close. It's just blazing with this colour and you can almost hear the energy humming you know, it's like hearing a generator in the background or something. It's like, it's like that kind of vibration going on as you're there um, at, at the door. Um, and then the door slowly opened, which to my relief, um, I was going to be let in because it took me ages to get there. I'm not going to lie. And um, this stunning, beautiful angel was in white robes with long, almost spiral cold blonde hair with the most bluest azure eyes I've ever seen in my life smiling at me and I remember feeling so humbled and so emotional I actually woke up crying from the meditation the first time around because it was so much to take on and he um, literally just gestured me in through the doors I don't know <coughs> if he is an angel that um, stands on that door all the time or is just the one there <coughs> the answer to the doorbell <coughs> sorry bad day um, but basically, he let me in. <clears throat> the foyer to the place um, was literally just all crystalline white. I would imagine that any human eye that looked at it, I should be blinded by it. The, the vibrancy and the brightness of it was just unbelievable. And there were various doors going off to various places. Now, I'm not going to be able to cover it all in this session. So obviously, I think we'll have to do another, another part to it. Um, but at, he asked me to choose what door I wanted to go in. So there were doors to the left, then there was a door right in front of me, and there's a door to the right. And so I thought, I'll go right. Um, and all, all of this is described in my book, Earthwalkers, Children for Light. And do you know what? I've done it as a fiction, but sometimes I wonder if I should just do it as a, a non-fiction spiritual philosophy of, you know, what they want to teach humans about heaven. Because... It's been backed up so many times, a description of it, but I'll go into that a bit later on. So I took the right-hand door, and he smiled and looked at me and went, OK. So I walked through, and it was like a chamber, and on the on the walls were cherubim, you know, like the really sweet little cherubim? And they were just, like, imprinted in the walls, and it was all, like, gold and gilt and all night and in the middle of the chamber in the middle of this vast room with a huge canopy over the top there was this white milky pool and um there were steps going into it it always it almost reminded me of like do you know you see films of cleopatra going into a milky pool it was a bit like that and for some reason i knew i had to go in the pool but i didn't at the same time it's really weird so i walked around and as i st stood by the steps waiting to go in the cherubim started coming out of the walls and they all started to um, not flow, I suppose manifest around the pole and they said we are the right hand of God. Now I've never really believed in heaven and God because I've always just believed in a higher power um, like the source of the universe so for this to take place for me was a bit of an eye opener. But, you know, God is a very, very open word, to be fair, because 
you know, I don't see God as the father of Jesus and sitting there on a throne. God to me is like the omnipresence. It's the power that pulsates from the core of the universe and that we're all connected to. So that's my version of God anyway. It can manifest into any image um, that will help us in whatever faith, creed or, you know, religion that we have. Um, so anyway, I started to step into this pool and as I looked at the milky pool, I could see what can only be described as fluorescent tadpoles, like going around in this pool. I'm like, oh my God. <clears throat> and so um, I saw the word sprites in my um, mind's eye and these cherubim were looking at me and I got into the pool and I ended up just laying on my back looking up and when I looked up at the canopy of the roof it changed to faces of angels and then someone said to me it was a beautiful voice I can't even describe that it was more delicious and not chocolate oh my god it was just everything to do with compassion love humility it just, that's what you felt when you heard the voice. It held its own energy, this voice of just complete peace and serenity. And it said, um, we create the walls, we create the structure of this place that you're residing in. And I'm like, right, okay. So it's made up of angel energy, I suppose. And then they said, allow yourself to see yourself, which I didn't really understand at the time. Um, and then the milky pool started bubbling and these little tadpole things, I could feel them rushing through me. Um, again, it was like a fresh bolt of energy, of fresh air, the smell of fresh rain. I don't, I can't understand, I can't, I really can't describe it better than that. Like, whew, going through me. And it turns out that these were like sentient beings that could read your soul and your progression on the earth path. And I realised then that this is what they were talking about when they said that some people are given a life review and if they've, they've done bad things in their life, they're taken to this pool where they basically face their own karmic judgment and basically the milky white substance is the um, conduit to your karma and whatever you've created, you bathe in it. Interesting, isn't it? So... Um, I basically saw flashes of my life, um, of all the hardships, of the abuse, things like that, um, the losses, and then I saw the things that I'd done in respect of that, of how I'd coped, and I saw the strength. I then saw me speaking to people up on a plinth, and there was just hundreds of thousands of faces around me, and I knew that my path was to teach and to... Um, bring down from them whatever they needed me to bring and I you know whether people believe it or not I don't care I'm doing what they've told me to do um and there was warmth forgiveness sorrow love vibrating through my essence the whole time I was there and it was basically showing me you know there were mistakes I made um from my own anger my own fears that I noted and that's what I've been working on in the last six years since I had my accident that gave me this condition um, and I acknowledged that and thought right okay um, and there was all sorts of things they showed me but basically the cherubim stayed smiling um, I won't go into it much more um, perhaps I could do another one on that but I, I want to get on to the other chambers um, but when I came out of it, I remember crying for a very long time and feeling this massive sense of um, awakening, but another massive sense of um, relief and self-forgiveness and a, a real massive need to learn how to um, understand self-love and self-respect. Um, and I just felt so thankful. When I looked up, though, these um, cherubim said we'd want to show you something and their heads turned around and they changed into oxen heads and lions and I thought what the f but that was going on oh my god I'm gonna die and they turned back around again and said find out about us so I'm like all right then so anyway um they then went back into the wall everything went still the sentient beings disappeared out of the pole and it just was like a mill pond I was like wow so that's when I came back um out of my meditation and I thought oh my god I've got to go back up there 
So I did another meditation when I had the time. Um, sometimes you can't get up there because the vibration's too high. And if you're like depressed or you know peed off or you've had a row with someone or you like worked too hard or you're knackered, you ain't gonna get there. It just won't happen. You'll just wander off somewhere else. Um, but I managed to get up there again, and this man again was at the door. Um, oh, beautiful. And he um said to me, "You haven't, you haven't um looked." you haven't learned about the the cherubim i was like mm. i went okay so i thought i better make a mindful note to research that bit about the oxen heads and the lion heads later on which i didn't but i'll tell you about that in a minute so he said pick a door so i decided to go straight forward and i went straight forward and opened the door and there was like an archway of red roses and the heat and the smell it was like a hot summer's day in a meadow smelling nature um, the honeysuckle, the jasmines, the, the strong pungent smell of roses, hearing birdsong, um, butterflies were fluttering past in the most magnificent colours I've ever seen in my life, dragonflies, birds just wandering by, hummingbirds, it was just absolutely beautiful and um, a voice said Ariel has created this garden I didn't all I know about Ariel is bloody washing powder you know we're going back a long time I have learned so much about the angel realms in the last six years of pure study and self-reflection and meditation so I was I was quite green back in those days about the dynamics of the you know the hierarchy of the angel realms and about heaven I didn't know anything if anything I was just completely stuck on I will bring messages from the afterlife from the spirit world so this was a whole new ball game for me um i walked in along this archway and then i looked across and i could see white and red rose bushes in this garden and my guide was there um khan who's like my healing guide and he come up to me and said look don't be afraid he said stay focused and I'll, I'll i'll take you through so i went along this path and again i can't even begin to explain to you the feeling the light the color of this place it is just beyond anything you could imagine there were streams and the stream sounded like they were singing you know everything had a noise or a vibration to it um it all had its own source of life everything every leaf every stalk every petal it was just oh stunning unbelievable and I was so humble that I was allowed to walk into this place and be there that my soul was allowed to raise into that consciousness of understanding um and I carried on walking and I started getting a bit scared actually because I thought oh my god am I dying is that why they brought me up here and it's just like no you need to show people you need to tell people come with me and so we went, walked up, and I started hearing the seraphim voices, right? And it absolutely, oh, my God, the bolt of shock. Because when I used to, I had quite an abusive um, adolescence. I was subject to a lot of physical, mental abuse. And um, I remember sometimes I used to, like, rock in the corner or, you know, after a bout of abuse, I'd hear this, this kind of vibration, this singing to me and it sounded like it was like I was listening to headphones but they were here and it was like a tinny kind of song sometimes it would go into my head so it found, sounded like the earphones were on my ears and other times it was away and I realized it was that bloody melody the song of the seraphim and I never knew that even as a kid after my dad died I remember hearing it and I thought my god they've been with me my whole life and that was a massive epiphany um and then I looked, and the, the seraphim are very different to normal angels. They've mainly got dark hair, and there's a reason for that. But again, that's another story. Um, and they look more Grecian, you know. And they've got long, again, long, like, you know, white robes um, with gold ropes going around their waists. And um, they were doing this song, just resonating from them. Oh, it was amazing. And he said, this is a seraphim. And they all looked at me, and when they look at you, oh my goodness, I can't even tell you. The brightness of their, they're like green, blue eyes. And they said, come, come. And what they were doing was, they were, there were other souls there, but I couldn't really see them properly. I did see them later on in years to come and realise who they were. But they were basically holding up these sort of conch shells, I suppose. And in the water, it was like a iridescent water. It was all different, like turquoises, pinks, blues, greens, golds. And they were scooping up this water. 
And then when I looked up, there was this, I realized that they were taking it from this huge fountain that's in the center. And they said, welcome to our celestial gardens, right? And when I looked up, halfway up the fountain was a lotus leaf. And it seemed to be humming its own vibration. I don't know if it's like the healing, res the healing frequency that we receive, but it was humming and the, the water was bubbling out from this lotus leaf and then going into the pole. And they said, as a human, you would know this as the, like the fountain of youth. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, because I remember my granddad taking me there once um, and showing me that. And they said, you can view any soul from this place. And they called it the Oculus of Maya. Now, I always thought Mother Nature was called Gaia, but they called her Maya, M-A-I-A. -A. And so they said, this is one of our portals where we can see you. We can acknowledge all of your feelings, listen to your thoughts and feelings as they come. This is also a portal for us to visit all the different planes. And she showed me a soul just literally dissolving into this water. She said, we also heal. And so she then showed me pictures of soldiers, of people that had really traumatic passings. And she was pouring and singing this water over these people. And I remember again crying my eyes out. My eyes was puffy as they are today. <laughs> On puffy day today. God bless them, me. Eh? Can hardly see. But anyway, um, so she said, come, come. And I sat on the side of this um, fountain and she was scooping this water up. And again, I can't even begin to describe the feeling, sorry, describe the feeling of that water as it was poured over me. There was such a complete sense of wholeness and peace and beauty as it was, I could feel it. It was like toothpaste, freshness, just going through the whole of my soul. Um, and it was just amazing. And she said, nobody hurts here nobody hurts we would always make sure they're safe and well and um Khan just stood there looking at me smiling why I received this excuse me healing water um and I can't remember I think I was out for about an hour and a half in that meditation because I didn't want to leave that place and um after they'd finished that they just all stood around me and they were stroking my face and stroking my hair and the, the smile was indescribable again. It was just the most beautiful, euphoric feeling, looking into the loving face of this angel. It was unbelievable. Um, and the seraphim, I later found out, are the highest and oldest order of the angels. Um, because at some point when I've been up there, they've actually turned into warrior stance, where they've got blazing fire behind them. I thought, what the bloody hell is this? And they said, we're also warriors and we also um, protect, um, try and protect the energies of the universe. And they also go to mass um, deaths and collect all the souls up and take them straight to the pool. Um, so, for instance, like, you know, the tsunami or, um, you know, all these awful terrorist attacks, they, they come and take all these souls up on mass um, straight to the celestial gardens. Um, and then when I looked around, I could see other layers. I could see, um, they said, there are the chambers of the um, the archangels. And then they said, there's a reality layer. I had no clue what they meant. I, what the hell's a reality layer? Um, and then they said, and there is where the omnipresence um, resides, which obviously is the core of the universe. And they said, and there is the all-seeing eye. And I'm like, right. And I was like, I don't know what the hell they're going on about. Um, and they showed me, and then they, and then Khan said to me, you need to draw this out so that you can understand it and comprehend it on a human level, because any other way you're not going to understand it. And so I thought, right, okay. Um, and he said, we will keep bringing you back and showing you different chambers. Um, and then I remember waking up feeling absolutely euphoric, beyond happy it was just I felt amazing when I woke up and um, before we go into another <clears throat> layer of the crystal palace heaven um, I just want to say that I am a skeptic so I kept thinking you know after all the kind of crap years I've had perhaps I'm creating this utopia just to make me feel better and so what I did was I started experimenting and I decided with my students um, at my workshops and circles I thought right let's let's have a little look at this and I was discovering more and more chambers and more and more layers of heaven 
Um, and so I thought, yeah, I'm definitely going to have a little play with this. So I basically sat and I took um, my first group of students up. Must have been back in, what, 2003, 2004. Um, and I was stunned because when they came back, they said, well, we went, well, there was these massive gates. We walked in and there was rooms to the left, which I subsequently know now are learning rooms for people that are developing that are have got high enough energy to get there. Some people didn't make it in the circle up there. And then one girl said, well, I went through the right-hand door and there was a big milky white pole. And I thought, oh, my God. And I hadn't told a soul about this because I thought everybody would go, yeah, whatever. Yeah, you can go to heaven. And you're like, nut job. You know, I honestly was ashamed of it then because I thought people would think I was some bloody spooky dooky weirdo and that I'd lose you know my my credibility which is awful but that's what I thought and I went what she goes yeah she goes you know those fat chubby things that that people have in their houses I'm like what cherubim she went, yeah them cherubs she said they were all around the wall it was all gold I'm like oh my god and she went into this milky white pole then someone else said oh I went into this lovely rose garden there was a fountain in the middle of it I'm like oh whoa whoa and people were basically corroborating what I'd already seen. And I had not said a word. And I was just gobsmacked because the more and more I did it, I was hungry to get the proof of this. And I just kept taking students up to this place as much as I could. And all the chambers that I'd seen and experienced and not shared with anybody apart from my soul journal, these people were describing them. I just couldn't believe it. And I was like so excited. And then when I started to um, look into it, like near-death experience and things like that, people were describing these layers and these places I've been to. And I was like, oh, my God, this is exactly what I've seen. Afterlife of Billy Fingers, reading that. I was crying my eyes out because I knew exactly what he was talking about. Um, a boy that goes to heaven and comes back and tells his sister. Um, brilliant book. And he got it right, actually, because he actually quotes a piece of music which he says sounds like the Seraphim, and it's pretty close, but nothing down here is going to be close to what it's like up there. Um, and basically, I, I became like almost obsessed with it because people were reporting exactly the same things I'd experienced, me taking them up there. And um, as I say, I looked at the near-death experiences and people were describing exactly the same sort of stuff. And I'm like, this is good, this is good stuff. Um, another time I went up there, um, obviously I wanted to know, I wanted to see my loved ones at the end of the day. I thought, if I can go up here, I bloody want to go and see my nan. Um, and so you can't push it though, because sometimes they're going to show you what you need to be shown, you know. Anyway, there was a huge, just past the celestial gardens, to the left there's like the energy and the chambers of the archangels. And then there's this huge meadow, it's like a valley. Um, with all these iridescent streams and oh god wildflower everything it's just stunning and beyond this valley they said go forward go forward and there's this huge archway right and they said this is a reality layer and they call the reality layer the area where human souls live the reality layer and I was like oh my god so this is like heaven in heaven and they went this is where human souls reside in between incarnations so oh my god so i walked through and then to the left um there's a rainbow bridge it was literally it's just but it's nothing like a rainbow down here it is just phew, unbelievable again all of this has been backed up and corroborated by other students that have gone in there and gone to this place and the rainbow bridge is where all the pets hang out so they obviously stay with um family members but they can also go and play together and they said, that's the Rainbow Bridge. That's where, you know, pet souls, sentient um, animals um, reside. And I asked about cows and sheep. And um, they basically said that the beings that have received love or acknowledge the frequency of human care and love are the ones that will reside here. So I don't know if that answers my question or not. Um, about, you know, I hate it, farm animals. And I don't want to talk about it, actually. Um... But anyway, so I walked forward and I was on a street and this will change for everybody because it's your reality. It's who you go to visit. And I was standing on the street thinking, well, I don't know where to bloody go. And suddenly, bang, I was sitting in this room. It was nothing like anything my nan's ever lived in, ever. 
Um, and she was sitting by the fire, smiling at me. My dog was by her feet, and that, oh my God, isn't it horrible? My nan's sitting there, I'm all right, but then my dog was there, and I lost, I just lost my shit. <laughs> I thought, oh my God, my dog. And then my dad come walking in, sat down, there was a fire burning, um, and family members started coming, and we were just sitting there like it was just the most normal thing in the world. And it was so surreal, because I think I'm making this up, I'm making this up. And you do, you do doubt it because, you know, it's the world's biggest question. You know, what happens to us after we die? And I've got and I've got the answer to it. And I'm like, this can't be right. It can't be right. But then what would happen is, is things are, I remember my dad saying, you don't believe this, do you? And I went, no, I think I'm making it up because I miss you so much. And he went and he gave me a bit of lavender. Right. And he said, just take that. So I went, right, OK, then. And um, so I took this bit of lavender and put it in my soul pocket, you know, because it's like 24-7 dreaming. It's like it's not your physical body there. But if, you know those dreams you have where it's the most realist, colourful, vibrant dream you've ever had in your life and you don't you remember every single second of it? It's like that. It's like just floating around and getting different images and vibrances and resonance. I'm, I'm talking pants and I resonances. I just... Oh, so overwhelmed with it it's it's like dreaming because you're not aware of your physical body you don't really care about your physical body you're just taking in the energy the colors and the vibrancy around you that's what it's like but you will sit there and you will feel if someone touches you you feel it if you drink something you can feel it going down if everything's the same you just haven't got your physical body it's exactly the same Apart from the fact that obviously everything is so much stronger in every single way and vibrant and clear and sharp. Um, so anyway, he gave me this bit of lavender and um, he said, you should go now because you've been out for a while. And I thought, bloody hell, and I thought, oh my God, I've got students with me. And it was like nearly like 45 minutes. So I panicked a bit and I came back down and um, I, I, all my lot was still out of it, all my students. And then when they come round, one of the students said, oh, I've been given something to give you, Nikki. And I said, what's that? She goes, "My your dad gave me a bit of lavender to give you. Work that one out. Work that one out. I was like, holy shit. So I went, thank you. And she goes, do you know what that means? I went, oh my God, do I know what that means? Um clever man my dad he was basically doing something so that I knew that it was real you know it's a one in a billion chance that someone's gonna know to say oh your dad um, has given you some lavender it was just and the hits just kept coming like that to back up my stupid um skepticism um, I couldn't I couldn't you know ignore it so I love it when I can take students up there because you can if you meditate and you do everything you can to raise your vibrations, which again I'll speak of later on. Um, you can go up and sit and have a cup of tea with your loved ones. You can go and do that. Um, there is absolutely 100% an afterlife. And all the times I've been up there, they give me lessons to bring back. Like, why do we come to earth? What's the meaning of life? Um, I've asked... I've been in the omnipresence cavern and asked questions about why they're suffering and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, it's going to go on too long, this video, and you're going to be falling asleep. Um, so I think that we can leave it there, and I will carry on talking about my visits to heaven um, in other videos so that you don't get too bored, because at the end of the day, you know, we're all busy. We can't be sitting around on our bums listening forever on these things. Um, but that's just my initial... Um, description of what heaven's like I don't I, sometimes I can't go up there at all I tried to the other day actually and I just didn't happen I just fell asleep unless they were subconsciously giving me healing I don't know but I tried to go up there the other day and it weren't happening it don't happen all the time I can't just walk in there like you do a shop and go hi I'm here um it's a very special occasions when you're at your most highest vibration at the moment my vibration is pants because I'm just still not very well um so that's why I've I've done these videos. I know I keep going on about it, but they're they're the things that make me feel like I'm doing something worthwhile. You know, it's, I've got a hundred subscribers now, and I've only been doing this a couple of weeks. So I really thank you for this. This is so important to me because it's all I can give you at the moment, um, as well as my writing. 
Um, so I just want to thank you for that. Anyway, I'm always bloody digressing, and I? So, yeah, I'm going to leave it at the cherubin chamber and reality layer and carry on again next time. What I will say is, is that when I decided to write, I had a dream back in 2014 um, that made me um, basically start writing Earthwalkers, Children of the Light, which is all about this. It's all about indigo children trying to save the planet. Um, and basically... I remember in the dream them showing me the cherubin chamber again and they said, and it was years ago, and they said, you never ever looked into this because they know I'm a sceptic. So I decided to just put in cherubim, right hand of God, because that's what it told me all those years ago. And oh my good God, in the Old Testament, um, they talk of the judgment chamber and the cherubim preside over it. And if your energy that is being judged, because God doesn't judge you, you basically go in that pool and it's your actions that create your, your future outcome. And um, basically, when it's a baddie in there, the cherubim's heads, it says in there about changing to oxen and lions. I was like, oh my God. So they were giving me like Old Testament stuff. I can't believe it. I've never read the Old Testament. I don't know anything about it. I've never adhered to that sort of like religious thing. But obviously, um, with all of this connection with heaven, you know, I've been shown a lot of Bible quotes to read um, that actually connect with the reality of heaven. However, throughout the translations, they've told me the book has changed um, for man-made purposes, power, control, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so I couldn't believe it when it said, and their face shall turn to oxen or lion. I'm like, oh my God, okay. Um, so then I asked, what happens when the baddies go in then? You know, so I've envisaged in my head people like Hitler. Um, and funnily enough, Fred West, you know, just someone that's just done that to his own kin and other people, obviously, that were connected to his family. And... They said, OK, we'll show you. So I remember going in and the fear and the coldness in the room was just awful. Oh my God, it was just awful. And I watched a black shadow. They didn't show me who it was. It was just a black shadow walk into the pool, right? And the pool and the cherubim came out of the wall and their heads literally turned. It was like bloody exorcist. It was horrible. Turned and there was all these really fearsome faces on them looking in on the pool. And I and I had a very quick glimpse of looking up as if I was the soul through the water and their faces looking down, really menacing. And it was, oh, it makes me shudder now. And I came and I, then I came back out, stood and watched. And basically the sentience, those little tadpole things, <laughs> whizzed through this soul within seconds, and then that was it. The 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 milky water started bubbling like to a frenzy it was a complete frenzy and then you saw these shriek streaks of like black come out into the milk right and it was just basically bubbling even more and this it was a bit like mercury it was just splitting this black right and it, it sounded and felt like even though i didn't hear the screams but the, the feeling of the vibration was millions of voices just screaming out but like in agony and in sorrow and pain and regret it was horrible oh my god it was so horrible and the milky substance almost turned black right and then it just went poof. and then within a second it was like a millstone like a white millstone right um sorry mill ponds and then the cherubim came up their heads turned and they look, all looked at me and then went back into the walls and the place was sublime again, full of serenity and calm. And it was in that instant that I realised that this pool had the ability, I don't know what's in it, I don't know what it is, but obviously to make it easier for me, they show it as a pool in a golden room. It obviously isn't that, but we've got I've got to have some imagery to work on to try and explain it to you. And it was in that instant that I realised that energy can dissipate in this pool. Energy can be torn apart, torn apart, never to um, exist again. So I don't know how, you know, it's like, then I thought, well, hang on a minute, what about the bloke at Birdbrook? You know, the ghost stunt. Um, he, he managed to 
come back down again. Um, and someone said, well, it's representing his form. It's representing his energy. It's almost mirroring his energy. And I don't quite get that, um, which I've got to ask more, I suppose, about. But all I do know is the real, real baddies, the ones, obviously, there is absolutely no way they can come back and heal from and learn from and come back down again. Their souls dissipate in that pool. And do you know what else it gave me as a human? All the people that have done me wrong or people that have hurt me physically and mentally. Um, it's not about retribution and it's not about revenge. It's about the fact that I know that every single person, and remember this, I know that every single person that has brought pain and hurt to people have got to face their own actions and their souls. And they basically bathe in what they've done to others. So when I look at people around in this world and I just think, my God, there's no justice, they're still alive, they're living down here, it's just because this is the hell, believe me. Um, and I just think, lovely, you just wait till you get up there and you face what you got to face, mate, because I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. And I tell you now, it was the most fearful, awful, abysmal experience I've ever, I've ever been through when that was happening. It was horrible. Um, so I've been present when karma's been dealt um, on a soul. Ugh. So don't think about avenging people that have hurt you. Don't think about um, it's unfair and there's, there's injustice. If you saw what I saw and felt what I felt, you would never worry again because when they go up there, mate, I'm telling you, they've done bad things, it will come back on them a thousandfold because that pool was just a boiling mass of filth, black misery. It was just awful. Um, and so I hope that brings you some comfort to all the people that you hope go in that pool when they go over. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there, my darlings, um, and I will come back with some more adventures in heaven just to give you a more clear view. We'll go a bit more into the reality layer as well and Rainbow Bridge to see what happens with all our pets. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this little section. I'm very tired now, so I've got to stop anyway. Um, but I just felt I needed to get something done. So this is, you know when I said about being kind to yourself on one of my in my last video? Um, this is my one thing I aim to do for the day. So I think I'm going to have a kip now um, because I'm exhausted. So anyway, take care. Thank you for watching my videos. Please share them with people you think it might help. Um, and I'll speak to you again soon. Bye now.